What's in a name depends on who you're talking to. It depends on who you're talking about. My dad's name is Carl, and my mom's name is Gracine. And when my older sister was born and they sought to name her, they thought of a clever way to name her. They put their two names together and came up with Carlene. A few years later, I was born, and they needed to come up a name with, for me, and my dad was thinking, I don't want to do a junior. I don't want him to have the same name as me. But how about we do the same initials? So they came up with a first name that started with K and a middle name that started with E, and here I am. Keith Eric Kruger. Often children are named after heroes in their family, patriarchs or matriarchs or, or names that have been passed out through their family. Often children are named because of some special meaning to the name that resonates with the parents. Parents often name their children because of a, a wonderful place they like to visit or for some maybe because that's where their child was conceived. What's in a name means a lot of things to a lot of different people. But when we talk about God and his name, I think it takes on a whole other meaning. Because when we talk about God's names or the names that we've been covering, of how he's been referred to over the years, it's always about his attributes. When we talk about God as the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. When we talk about God as a provider, and God as a protector, and God as love, we're speaking about who he is. And so we're getting a better picture of who our God is by looking at his name. The meaning is so, so deep. Today we're looking at the name Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. And we're first introduced to this name in Judges 6. And we're going to give you a little bit of a backstory about what is going on before Judges 6. And this is a time when the Israelites are having a really, really difficult go of it. I was thinking that just a few months ago, my family decided that we wanted to, to build some raised bed gardens, and we figured we wanted to, to do some planning and maybe not have to go buy as many produce items and grow them ourselves. So I built these raised bed gardens, and I put down the gopher wire, and I put down the weed fabric, and I went and got organic compost, and I, got the, I did it right. I went and got like non-GMO organic seeds eaten and planted it all i got to tell you, the, the only thing that's currently growing is the one thing we're not caring for. Everything else is dead. So then a few weeks ago, I figured, you know what, I can't grow anything from seed. So I was at Costco, and they had these most beautiful hydrangea plants. They were blossomed. They were full. Like, they were ready to go. And so we have a drip irrigation system in our front yard. And, uh, and so I planted these three beautiful hydrangeas. Uh, I tapped into the drip irrigation system. I tested the lines. I got water to all of the plants. And I said, okay, it's good to go. I did this like 9, 10 o'clock at night. We were heading out of town the next day for two weeks. I came back two weeks later to some stumps of hydrangeas. They're dead and gone. And I share that with you because... I spent a few minutes on each of these projects or a few hours and felt utterly defeated by the end result. The Israelites, year after year for seven years, planted crops, fed crops, cultivated crops, and year after year, Midianites would come in like a swarm of locusts and they would take everything at harvest time from them. They'd regroup, they'd go into the next year, they'd do it again, and the same thing happened again. Gideon finds himself at one point in the story when God approaches him. He's in a wine press, which is an area where you would stomp on grapes to try to make wine. He's hiding in a wine press threshing wheat, trying to just pull some of the usable pieces out of wheat because he didn't want the enemy to come in, swoop in and take his stuff. Everything was gone. Everything was stolen. Livestock was wiped out. And this is where we are in the story when we first hear Jehovah Shalom. In Judges 6, verse 24, we read, So Gideon 
built an altar to the Lord. And there he called it, the Lord is peace. Today it stands in Ophrah of the Abizarites. Like I said, when we look at the names of God, we are looking at his attributes. And here in this setting, with this thing going on year after year for the Israelites, Gideon builds an altar and says, the Lord is peace. What does it mean for God to be of peace? I I think a big thing about the attribute of peace that's different than many of the others is really addressed in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And it says, do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. When I think of God as protector, I think of a God who's outside of me, building a hedge around me and keeping me protected from the harms in my life. When I think of God as a provider, I think of a God who's external to me, who is giving to me, who's helping me feed my family, who's helping me pay the bills, who's helping my family have what they need to get by. But when I think of Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. I'm drawn to 1 Corinthians 6, 19, that the Holy Spirit of God, who is God and who is peace, dwells within each and every follower of Jesus. This isn't something external to us, but it's something that is in us and with us constantly and consistently, which is amazing to me. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There is so much in these two verses that we could unpack. But there's a couple pieces I want to pull out. And one that I want to pull out is that the peace of God offers protection. But not protection in like the traditional sense. Protection of our hearts and our minds which is where anxiety comes from, which is where fear comes from, which is where the absence of peace comes from. As we have thoughts in our mind and feelings in our heart that we meditate on, that we have angst over, that we nurture and cultivate, peace gets left to the side. But I also love this part is that I'm up here trying to explain the peace of God Paul said here in his letter to the Philippians that this is a peace that transcends understanding. He says you're not going to get it. You're not going to fully comprehend this peace. And I'm sorry that as a pastor at this church, I'm getting up here and telling you this. But it's true. I'm not going to fully be able to explain it to you other than to tell you that is absolutely real. I can honestly say that my life has been completely transformed because of the peace of God. There's so many times in my life where I could see God's peace at work in my life when from the outside it really shouldn't have happened. And the first time that I can so clearly remember it was when my oldest daughter was two years old. When she spent eight days in the hospital after having a seizure for six hours, when doctors didn't have any answers, didn't know what was going to happen, didn't know how to treat her, We didn't know what our future was going to look like. I can honestly tell you, I had peace. I didn't know if my daughter was going to be okay. I I truly didn't. I was believing she would be. Today she's a high school graduate doing wonderful and everything is great. And she has turned out okay. But in the midst of that storm... Like we just sang about it. And I know it's easy to be on church on Sunday morning or Wednesday night and sing a song. And then in the storm, it's not always quite as easy. But I remember that peace very clearly. I remember when my wife was pregnant with our second child. And I came home and I said, I lost my job today. I didn't know what we were going to do. I didn't know what our immediate future held And I said, we're going to be okay. 
God's got us. I had a peace that I truly can't explain to you. But it was there. And some of you heard this on Sunday, but last week, as I watched my car burn up in front of my house, and my wife and I looked at each other, and she goes, what's next? It just seems like there's so many things hitting us. We both had peace. We had peace. God's got us. God's in control. The peace of God has absolutely changed the way I approach storms in my life. And I can't personally tell you how to get it other than a few things I'm going to talk about today, but it's real, and it changes lives. And it's well more than singing a song in church. It can change the way you approach every day. It changed Gideon's life. It changed the Israelites' life as well. We continue on in in Judges, and we read in Judges 6, 12 through 14. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Gideon had heard for his entire life the stories of God's provision and God's protection and God's caring for his people. He knew it. He said, where's God now? I've heard all the stories. I've heard where he's come through in the past. But now, now where is he now? Like, why are we having to deal with this stuff now? And I share this a lot. It's so easy to judge someone from the Bible from thousands of years ago. But the truth is, I really believe we have that same danger in our lives. Like I can get up here and I can tell you about just a few stories where I believe that God was there for me through difficult situations. And then the next one comes and and I have a danger of not remembering what he did before. I want to encourage you to remember how he's been there. Remember how he's protected, how he's provided, how he's given peace when the next thing comes. I know you've heard this before. The next thing is going to come. You're going to have a battle. You're going to have a storm. You're going to have some difficulties in your life. We can't allow the situations in our lives to blind us to what God has done, to get in the way of us having hope about what God is going to do. But then I also love what what he said. He said, go in the strength you have. Now I gotta tell you, Gideon follows this up with me, strength? I've got no strength. My clan is the least in all of Manasseh and I am the weakest in all of my clan. Like I'm the least of the least. I'm the most powerless person out there. I got nothing to offer. I got no strength. There is no way I'm a mighty warrior. And God said, yeah, you are. Go in the strength you have. Because here's the reality for us. It's not our own strength. It's the strength of God. When we embrace the reality that those who know Jesus, who are followers of Jesus, who have accepted his gift of atonement for our sins, we now have him living in us. We have all the strength in the world because we have the strength of the almighty, powerful God in us. Go in the strength you have. He didn't say go in the strength you're going to end up with. Don't go in the strength you hope you'll get. He said go in the strength you have. And like I said, his response was, not me. I don't got it. I'm the least. And in Judges 6.23, the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. I believe that the peace of God gives us courage to overcome fear. I truly don't believe that it takes away fear. 
I don't think that we're supposed to be blinded to the situations in our life. I think we're supposed to be reasonable and God wants us to approach things prayerfully and cautiously, but with a confidence that he's going to give us courage to overcome that fear. I believe that he will give us the strength to overcome the things in our life if we hold on to him. And I love fast-forwarding to Judges 7.17. And in Judges 7.17, Gideon is speaking. And he says, watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of camp, do exactly as I do. Gideon went from coward, threshing wheat in a wine press to listening to the Lord tell him, I've got you, I'm with you. And there was a transformation that took place there where Gideon now saw himself as that guy. Because see, the Lord's peace brings out confidence. And it's not confidence in himself because he didn't change who he was. He still was from the weakest clan. He still was the least in that family. But he now understood that he wasn't doing it alone. He understood that this battle wasn't his. This battle was the Lord's. I gotta tell you, it's easy for us to go into a battle, whatever it may be, financial, relational, health, you name it, and try to figure out how we're going to fix this. And maybe sometimes as an afterthought, we'll throw up a prayer to God. But what if we looked at each of those battles, each of those obstacles as the Lord's to overcome, as God's to defeat, not ours? The Lord's peace brings confidence. And then Judges 7.22 And there's a lot in this story, and I love Gideon, and it's a fantastic one. I'll cut to the chase. Gideon's got an army of 300 going against thousands and tens of thousands of Midianites. God wanted him to have an army of 300 because he didn't want there to be any doubt that it wasn't Gideon and his army that did the defeating, but that it was God. In 722, we read, when the 300 trumpets sounded... The Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. You see, the Lord's peace brings victory. The Lord's peace brings victory in our battles here and now, in the short term. But we can't lose sight of the fact that more importantly, the peace of the Lord brings victory eternally. Victory over the enemy. Victory over Satan. Victory over death. This is all possible when we embrace the peace that comes from God. There's a little bit of a caveat there. I think there's a little bit of a something we got to do, though, and it's found in Matthew 14. This is the story of Peter and Jesus and Peter walking on the water. We read in verse 28, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? It is so easy when we're not in a conflict, when we're not in a storm, when we don't have the winds raging and the storms seas to go, I got it, I trust God, I, I, I'm in. I'll have faith in him, I'll believe in it, I will rest in his peace, I will hold on to it, and then the storm comes, the winds blow, and we're like, ah! Lord, save me! If Peter would have just kept his eyes on Jesus, he was walking on water, Right, let's not miss that point. He did. He stepped down out of the boat and he was going. But then he doubted. And I don't think he doubted himself. I think he doubted God. He didn't think 
Jesus had him when Jesus said come. He's like, he didn't really mean come, did he? He, he did. We've got to have faith. We must have faith. When we keep our eyes on Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. He will give us strength. He will give us courage. He will give us confidence. And he will give us victory as he overcomes the storms in our life. As he wins the battles. Again, we just sang it. The battle is yours, Lord. What would happen in our lives if we embrace this idea that we've got the Lord of peace living in us? That we've got God's peace through every single difficulty in our life. And if we keep our eyes on him, if we trust in him, he will give us what we need. I truly believe our lives will be changed. I believe as we interact with other people who don't know Jesus, their lives will be changed because they will see something in us that they don't have. And they'll see something that they can have that is only available through God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your peace. I thank you that you provide strength and courage and confidence and ultimately victory. And I pray that as we sing some more songs, we reflect on the message you have for us, that you would stir in our hearts a desire to truly live differently, to live each step of our lives with more reliance on you, to, to live with a greater peace and understanding that you've got us in your hands, not just when we're singing songs, but when we're in the fire, when we're in the storms, when we're in the trials. May we be a representation of what is possible to wholeheartedly follow you and rely on your peace. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.